Welcome to Storytime, brought to you by the Brinker Books Cyber Convention and Book Expo. This is an excerpt from Murder in Absentia by Asaf Meyer. We left before dawn the next day. Young Marcus turned out to be a decent sailor, and we were accompanied by one of his father's slaves to help. Marcus introduced to him as Ariath Brinis, and he seemed used to the young master's trips. The people who lived primarily in the Kerbrick Archipelago, Archipelago Sailing was a part of life. Every child learnt to swim and sail almost as soon as they could walk. We sailed west out of the Bay of Kerberos, as the sky was just turning, beginning to turn pink behind the massive dark shapes of Mons Crodus. We rounded the western cape of Kerberos, and Marcus kept us on the outer edge of the archipelago. From his description, I understood that the island on which he had seen the Lamia, as he still insisted on calling her, was on the furthest northern reaches. We barely spoke as we sailed, Ariothrinus and Marcus so used to sailing together that they hardly needed to talk. I helped where I could, but spent much time merely sightseeing as we passed many islands on the way. Some were green, with trees and shrubs, dotted with farms and villas. Some were barely more than rocks, jutting out of the sea, covered in windswept hardy grass and fit only for seagulls. Boat traffic increased between the islands of the archipelago as the day wore on, and we tried to stay away from the bulk of it. We anchored in a cosy cove for a short rest and early lunch, and Marcus assured me that we were near, with perhaps an hour's sailing left to the Lamaya's island. Publis Corpio's kitchen slaves had packed provisions for us for the day. Sitting on the deck, eating our lunch amidst the pastoral islands, watching the blue skies with scudding white clouds, the clear waters teeming with fish. The sailboats dotted the horizons with their striped square sails. I found it hard to consider that we might be facing a dangerous monster on our next stop. Sometime in the seventh hour of the day, we reached an island standing alone some distance away from the rest of the archipelago. It was of medium size, a big hill in its centre supporting a large copse of trees, and a brook running down through the verdant meadows to the rocky beach. I saw no signs of human habitation at all. Mere separation could not explain where the people of the archipelago would shun such a beautiful island such as this. We anchored close to the beach and rowed a light dinghy ashore. Ariathunis stayed with the boat. Marcus led me up the hill towards the copse of trees. I saw her on this side of the island, he said in a low voice, and I think she lives in a cave of sorts among the trees. We continued to clamber up the hill in silence. We reached the tree line and stopped for a moment to catch our breath in their shadow. As we stood staring into the gloomy dark shadows amongst the dense foliage, the folly of my actions suddenly caught up with me. Taking my employer's nephew, still a child, without escort, without proper preparation, armed only with my dagger, to meet an unknown entity who may or may not have been a flesh-eating Lamaya. Not the time to dwell on such matters. I loosened my dagger in its scabbard, and we started into the woods. We wandered under the branches at the edge of looking for a path in it. As we rounded a jutting boulder, I saw some sheep roaming freely in the green meadow. No one was in sight, and even the sheep were eerily quiet. Marcus touched my arms and reached silently to a narrow path between the trees, leading to the grove. We turned in and followed it slowly. We walked amongst gnarled trees and dense shrubs. A few paces in and we could no longer hear the waves of the sea, every sound becoming muffled, ominous. After a few minutes of walking as silently as we could, jumping with racing hearts at each snapped twig, we reached a sunny clearing. A low hut stood next to a pool, fed by a spring at the side of the large rock formation. The hut was old, with wattle and daub walls and a thatched roof. A, shadowed win a shuttered window was next to the rickety door, and both were closed. A thin wisp of smoke was coming out of the chimney. We stepped into the clearing. Hello, I said loudly. No answer. We answered the We approached the small hut. Hello, I said again louder. No need to shout here. You have no clout, said a hoarse voice right behind me. We turned and saw a wizened old woman, old beyond belief. Her face was deeply lined with age and exposure to the elements. She was short and thin, though not bent. Dressed in a rough woolen tunic, much patched and frayed, but kept clean. She looked at us with sparkling eyes, smiling faintly. I had no visitors at all this winter, yet I knew in spring you would come hither. 
This is no Lamia before me, I realized. The whole setting was too pastoral. I relaxed a little. I had met many charlatans and several mad hermits in my life, so I baited her with, You knew we would come? Oh, yes. This young man I have seen before, and last autumn his cousin came ashore. And you, a lucky fox, standing there like a slow ox, on a journey to find the truth of what happened to the poor youth. I heard Marcus swallowing next to me and shut my own mouth with a snap. That was far too precise to be mere charlatan patter. I deemed it prudent to proceed politely and car uh, carefully. Please forgive us for the intrusion on your island. Could you tell us about the cousin's visit? The young man was seeking thrills and attempted something in lacking in skills. He came to me to find an answer, though he didn't know it would end in disaster. His actions caused himself the blight, for he did not know uh, well under the light. Could you tell us the questions he asked you and what answers you gave him, I asked. Those things I cannot do. They belong to him, not to you. I was talking to a Sybil. Of that much I was certain. The trouble was, their prophecies, is that while accurate, they are usually completely useless to us mortals until after the fact. How could I make the best of this? Would you help me find out who killed him? A direct approach. That I can do with glee, but first you must drink my tea. However, you must be aware of things neither here nor there. You seek now to find a missing spell. Always careful when you look down a well. The image of a bloated body floating in the well rose unbidden in my mind, and I shuddered involuntarily under the sibyl's per piercing gaze. I had no doubt that this was what she meant. Come now, do not fear. There is a reason why you are here. We shall drink some tea, so that hidden things you might see. She walked past me into her hut. Marcus and I looked at each other for a moment, then followed him inside. As we waited for our eyes to adjust to the gloom of the hut, our noses were subjected to a dense and complex aroma. From wood fire smoke to dry meats to floral bouquets, it was not unpleasant, rather sweet and earthy. The interior of her hut was made up of one room, a simple cot in one corner, a half with a black pot on the embers in another. A rickety table and stalls in the middle, a midside chest against the wall, both covered with rough fabric and supporting household items, cups and dishes, a bronze mirror and a few closed boxes. Various dried sausages and bunched herbs were hanging from the rafters. The sibyl handed me a pot, saying, Be a dear and take this thing. Bring me water from the spring. I took the pot and went outside. As I knelt on the moss-covered stones next to the small pool, I felt my skin tingle. I looked into the pool, but ripples made by the dripping spring waters obscured its depths. As I dipped the pot into the water, the feeling intensified. This was an old place, a place where the power of an ancient human lived. Our people once revered human of nature, and many of us still do. Our months, our holidays, are named for them. But then... The Encantores had asserted that this was just energy that could be harnessed, that new philosophers could free men from superstition. Regardless, the old folk wisdom knew better, and in places like this, one could not argue with it. I muttered an old formula of thanks to the nymph in the spring, feeling foolish as I said it, and knowing full well my old college buddies would have laughed at me for saying it. Now, having been expelled from the Collegium, and having travelled the world, I had seen more things than I could comfortably explain. I wondered how long there had been Sibyls here, caring for the Newman of the Spring and living in its power. Back inside, the Sibyl took the pot from me, added crushed, uh, crushed herbs and put it on the fire. Now we wait until the tea is ready, which we'll know when the aroma is quite heady. While we waited, the Sibyl potted around, clearing the table and setting three cups. She dipped bay leaves in honey and placed one in each cup. We shall do this one at a time, or otherwise it might confuse my rhyme. First the young one whose dreams are fun, then the fox who should learn to trust, and this old Sibyl's tea in trust. You don't have to do this, I said to Marcus. We bet I hardly know anything about this woman. You yourself thought she was a Lamaya. This is not an un this is an unnecessary risk. It's a Sybil, Felix, he said, rolling his eyes. I know my legends and law. I may have been a frightened boy when I thought she was a liar, but now I am almost a man. I will not miss a chance to receive my own prophecy. The Sybil held the pot with a folded towel and took it off the fire. 
poured the steaming brew into the cup before Marcus and placed it back on the hearth. Breathe the steam, drink and dream. Marcus did as instructed, holding the cup gently and blowing on the liquid, inhaling the steam. He took a first careful sip, his face brightened, and he sipped some more. Whatever is in here, it's actually quite nut. His face and hands froze. His eyes glazed without changing expression. He very carefully put his cup down. I caught it and guided it gently to the table so he wouldn't spill the hot brew on himself. The mind of the young, free of distraction, his dreams will grant him much satisfaction, said the sibyl. And mine? I look at her sidelong. That you will see when you drink my tea. She said it with a cryptic smile. Tell me, I asked. When the young man's cousin was here last year, was he alone? He came here with a friend and both drank my special blend. And you will not tell me anything about else about it, will you? She just smiled and continued to dust around her hut. A few minutes later, Marcus began to stir. He drew a deep breath and the colour and animation returned to his face. Did you learn anything, I asked? His face reddened. I, I think so. Can't quite make sense of it, though. That's normal with Sybil's prophecies. I shot the Sybil aside long look. The boy's prophecy is his alone, to heed its me message or be moaned. I saw myself as an old man, sitting in my family's house, dressed richly with very fine things all around me, Marcus continued. That sounds like a good future, I said. It's just that, you see, I felt this great dissatisfaction, disillusioned, thoroughly miserable, a life wasted. I waited for him to continue. I'm not sure what led me there. What choices will I make in life to lead down such a path? And how might I avoid making the wrong ones? I need to think about it. And now you, said the Sybil, sit and drink my brew. She poured another measure of the tea into the cup in front of me. I raised it carefully and breathed in the steaming surface. The aroma reminded me of the scent of spring flowers wafting over crisp snow. I took a careful sip. I could taste the honey, the flowers and other things besides, which I could not quite place. It was earthy, rich, comforting in a way. I took another sip.